All good. Great. Can you let me know when you can see my screen? Yes. OK, great. So should we get started? OK. Oh, Jing, you're on mute. Um, uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. I can see your screen and everything. I think okay. we'll have uh, awesome. folks joining in anyway. And I see uh, we have uh, Dr. Yuki joined as well. So thank you. I will mute myself. All right, great. So um, thank, thanks everybody for, for putting up with me a little bit tonight. So um, <clears throat> on the last uh, ABAC steering committee uh, discussion, one of the topics that's come up across all of the studies has been about um, how we can standardize our approaches for estimating or characterizing incidence and prevalence across various studies. Um, and uh, I had volunteered to come to just provide a overall conceptual overview about how we have been thinking about uh, characterizing incidence rates and incidence proportions and prevalences um, to talk about the conceptual difference between those, but then also to show you how to use Odyssey tools to perform those analyses. Um, I, I probably am going to have about 20 minutes of content here to walk you through the conceptual definitions as well as how to implement them, and then I'm hoping that we can have some time for discussion about what we want to be doing within each of the APAC study teams about what we actually are trying to characterize and to make sure that we're using the right tools for that. So please do um, uh, use the chat or raise your hand to uh, let me know if you have any questions along the way or just feel free to unmute yourself and, and scream out if anything I say doesn't make any sense. All right. So I'm going to start first by talking about incidence and incidence rates, um, because this is one of the primary metrics that we have been computing across a lot of different Odyssey studies. So an incidence rate is the number of new outcomes within a defined time at risk divided by the person time within a population at risk. And so the incidence rate is a statistic that uses time as its denominator, and it counts up the number of successive events that has occurred within some sort of time at risk. Now, very often people will get a little bit too casual with the use of their language and they will talk about incidents, but it's important to highlight that there are two different metrics when someone uses the word incidents. There is the incidence rate, which is what I just defined, and then there's also an incidence proportion. And an incidence proportion is defined as the number of persons with a new outcome within a defined time at risk divided by the number of persons with at least one day at risk within the population at risk. And the distinction between these is actually, it, it's, it's somewhat subtle, but it's actually important as we are trying to choose a metric. In an incidence rate, we are counting the number of new events, and that actually means that one person could have multiple events. And we're dividing that by a unit of time, so it's usually like person years, as something that we try to measure within the population. In an incidence proportion, we are uh, the, the both the numerator and the denominator are in units of people, where the numerator could be number of persons with a new outcome. What that typically means is that one person can either have a new outcome or could not have a new outcome, but it's a binary state. Um, and that denominator is basically the number of people just that are eligible, which just means that they have at least one day of time at risk. Um, <clears throat> neither of these are right or wrong in terms of incidence measures, but they are different metrics. They are on different scales. Um, and depending on what kind of comparison you are trying to make, there may be reasons and arguments for these. And part of the reason I want to make sure that there's plenty of time at the end is to talk about your specific studies and what metrics might actually make sense. The one thing that's similar between an incidence rate and an incidence proportion, though, is this notion of trying to identify new outcomes. Um, and that's quite different from prevalence, which I'll get into in just a minute. 
Now, um, I'm starting here with incidence as uh, uh, the quantity of interest in an incidence rate and incidence proportion, because it turns out that this happens to be the more complex of the epidemiologic measures to do correctly. Uh, and often, very, very often, certainly greater than 90% of the literature that I read, there are details associated with how to compute an incidence that aren't always shared or are not necessarily done correctly. So I'm going to describe why this is kind of complex just so that you all have a conceptual understanding of it and we can think about what that means for your studies. So um, if you were to pick up any basic epidemiology textbook, you'd probably see some sort of picture like what I'm about to draw here uh, when they're trying to describe the idea of incidence. What they would usually show is that there's some set of individuals who are followed for some period of time. Here I'm de depicting this uh, in the, on the x-axis is calendar time from 2017 to 2020. And you'll usually see this picture in a textbook where it shows like three people start at 2017, they're followed until such time that some of those people have the outcome, which I'm depicting by this red star. And in this particular case, if I were to think about the incidence uh, proportion, well, we can see that we had three individuals and one of them had an outcome, so our incidence proportion could be one over three. The way that we would compute an incidence rate is that we would identify that there was one new outcome, that's the, the red star, and we would see that there was that was during this time horizon of three years at risk. What would happen is that the first person would contribute three years of time at risk, the second person would contribute three years of time at risk, but the third person would only contribute two years of time at risk because once the new outcome has happened, that person can be censored and therefore uh, not uh, observed to have um, uh, subsequent follow-up time. And like I said, if you pick up pretty much any of the epi textbooks back there on my bookcase, and you're to flip to the page that describes incidence, this is kind of the picture that you generally see that they describe it as. It turns out within our electronic health record data systems uh, and all the databases we have across the Odyssey network, there are a lot more confusing situations that we actually have to consider when we calculate incidents. <clears throat> For example, not everybody starts or ends their observation period on exactly the dates that we're interested in. So here's an example of a person I'm drawing whose observation period start is after the time at risk start and their observation period end is before the time at risk end. And we have to consider whether or not we would allow for a person who does not have full time at risk to be considered in a study. Oftentimes with incidence rates, we, we would allow such a person to contribute the time that they have available. We also have the situation where a person could actually enter a enter and exit the, the population at risk multiple times. So many of you have databases where a given person could have multiple observation periods. For example, if you're working with a hospital data source where you have an observation period defined by the periods of time when someone's admitted and discharged and a person could come back to the hospital multiple times. In that case, one person could have multiple entry, uh, uh, multiple entries into your cohort. <clears throat> it's also possible that since our definition of a new time, at, uh, a new outcome, is some event that occurs, then uh, it's possible, depending on the outcome, that you might allow for the possibility that a person could have recurrence of an event, in which case. There's some moment in time when an event happens. There's some period of time where we would consider that person to be ineligible for a new event. And then there's some subsequent time when they become at risk yet again. And so this notion that an outcome has a clean window that could be applied inside of analysis is, is, is a consideration. We also have the possibility that outcomes recur which means that one given individual could contribute not only multiple periods of time at risk, but actually could contribute multiple outcomes. So if our denominator, if our numerator is the number of outcomes, then it's possible that one person can contribute multiple times. We will see in our data the situation where some people will have prior events 
and that may impact their eligibility. So for example, this person that I'm drawing has an outcome that precedes the time at risk and that clean window associated with the outcome overlaps the entire time that that person is um, potentially at risk, which means that that person may need to be excluded from the incidence analysis. We also can have a situation where we define a time at risk for a given outcome and outcomes may fall outside of the time at risk relative to our cohort entry. Um, so for example, if we are saying looking for outcomes that occur within 90 days of an exposure, then any outcome that's longer than 90 days in the size of exposure, we may see them in our data set, but we wanna make sure that we don't count them. And then to, to make all of this way more complex is that different people have different characteristics. So we have, you know, different demographics, different prior conditions, different health behaviors, and all of this stuff will actually potentially influence our estimate of an incidence rate. So in this particular case, if I was taking all of this, this cartoon into play, I would have to exclude the person who is, does not actually contribute any time. I do not count the outcomes that are outside of the time at risk, but what I can see is that I do observe four new outcomes where the, who are contributed from three different persons. And I can count up the lengths of these blue bars to calculate the time at risk, and that would give me my incidence rate. Or given the exact same data set, I could calculate the incidence proportion by counting the number of people with a new event, that'd be one, two, three, and dividing, by, dividing that by the number of people who had at least one day at risk. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, not exclude this per, or excluding this person, eight, nine. So now my incidence proportion would be three persons over nine persons. And that metric will be quite different than the incidence rate metric, which is for incorporating number of outcomes and person time. So the reason I'm going through this, this kind of somewhat complex detail here um, is because we often use incidence rates in lots of our analyses and we make, and most commonly, we are making comparisons between incidence rates. So the most common thing when people say they want to produce an incidence rate, it's usually because they want to compare, <coughs> excuse me, some observed incidence rate that they've, they've defined with some sort of expectation that they're gonna use to make a comparison. And formally, if you have incidence rates, then the, uh, dividing an observed incidence rate by an expected incidence rate, this is an incidence rate ratio. And indeed, if we are doing some sort of causal inference, um, we have metric, we have measures that actually produce this adjusted incidence rate ratio as the statistic that we're interested in. And since we're talking about causal inference, then we need to be considering all of the typical concerns about what is the appropriate epidemiologic design to estimate these incidence rates, as well as to think about the sources of bias that can occur when estimating an incidence rate, such as issues about measurement error, selection bias, and confounding. But regardless of, of whether you're talking about an incidence rate or an incidence proportion, there's oftentimes some sort of element of comparison that one wants to make when they're producing an incidence rate so that they're trying to make some draw some inference examples studies of the odyssey network where we've done incidents um, includes our work last year that was published in the bmj led by jing tung lee where we estimated the incidence of uh, the adverse events associated with covid vaccines and that the incidence rates that we computed um, were based on background background rates that preceded COVID or the vaccination practice. And those background rates were used in comparisons with the observed incidence rates that was observed amongst people who were vaccinated. And so both um, on the US side at the FDA, as well as on the European side with the EMA, they are relying very heavily on an incidence rate ratio comparison between an expected background incidence rate and the observed incidence rate amongst those that are vaccinated. And so we've honestly contributed those background rates to the FDA and the EMA to support their, 
safety surveillance activities. So I went through incidence rate there uh, pretty quickly. I'm now just going to highlight prevalence. So um, I want to co contrast an incidence proportion, which is what I've previously discussed. That's the number of persons with a new outcome within a defined time at risk divided by the number of persons with at least one day at risk in the population at risk. In contrast, a prevalence also is a proportion. So that means it's its unit is measured in persons. Um, and here what we define is our numerator is the number of persons who have a condition within a defined time at risk divided by the number of persons with at least one day at risk within the population at risk. So I'm trying to color code this to try to highlight some of the similarities and differences. The first difference you'll notice is that the numerator is slightly different because incidence is trying to focus on persons with a new outcome and prevalence is trying to focus on people who have a condition. So to make this clear, the difference here is that a prevalence is trying to find persons who have a condition and that is the combination of people with pre-existing disease plus people with a new outcome. So a prevalence is most often used in the context of thinking about chronic diseases, where we want to ask a question like, what proportion of a population actively has some chronic disease? So this makes a lot of sense if we're thinking about like a chronic disease like multiple sclerosis, where we are not only interested in those who develop multiple sclerosis within a time horizon, but we're also maybe interested in those who actively have multiple sclerosis. So we're previously diagnosed and still maintain that disease state. So an important difference is whether or not you care about pre-existing disease in your study. Another difference between an incidence proportion and a prevalence is how we define population at risk. And specifically, while we've described in both of these, we said we've defined it as population at risk, who is at risk is actually can be different between an incidence calculation and a prevalence calculation. So a population at risk excludes people who are not eligible to be part of the numerator. So in, in this context, that can mean excluding persons with pre-existing disease if you're doing an incidence calculation. Because in order to have new outcome, that might mean you cannot have previously ex had previous existing con uh, condition. Whereas in a prevalence calculation, you would actually want to include the people with pre-existing disease because they're part of the numerator that you're trying to characterize. So um, with, with this in, in mind, one of the things that I want to make sure that we spend most of our time today talking about is what specific measure are we looking for? Are we are we interested in an incidence or a prevalence? <clears throat> and then we can talk about what metric we we want to, um, to 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 use, whether that be an incidence rate or an incidence proportion, or in the context of a prevalence, it will be a proportion, but we can make sure to define our our numerator and denominator correctly. Um, one last thing, and then I'm going to stop and, and, and ask if there's any questions. Um, within Odyssey, we have a variety of tools that support calculating whether you're interested in an incidence rate or an incidence proportion or a prevalence. We have tools to support this activity, and I'm happy to walk through a, a, a live demo to show you exactly how this is done using the tools today. Um, but I'll just give you kind of the, 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 the super quick cheat sheet for how, how to think about this. If you are interested in an incidence rate in an incidence proportion and your outcome is a chronic disease that basically can't recur. So I think multiple sclerosis would be a good example of that as insofar as I understand what the, the team's interested in. Um, then there are two ways that you could calculate this and you basically you will get the same answer. If you are inclined to want to use our web interface, then inside of Atlas, there is a function called incidence rates, and it will in fact compute for you the incidence rates and incidence proportions, so long as you can define your target population, which is kind of your denominator of the people at risk, 
and can also define a cohort of your numerator, which are the people who have the new outcomes. We also have an R package available out on the Odyssey Git repo called cohort incidents. And so if you are prefer to just write directly in code in R, you can call the uh, cohort incidents package and execute basically by passing in a target cohort in an out and an outcome cohort. <clears throat> and you will get the same results between these two packages in this simple case. If, however, the outcome that you are interested in is something with, which is an acute event that can potentially recur. So the example I'm providing here is like influenza, where every season you have a chance of getting influenza. Um, so therefore, we would not want to consider that to be a disease state that once you have it, you're stuck in the state of having influenza forever. Um, but rather, we would think of it as a state that can come and go and can come and go repeatedly. Then uh, you should not use the Atlas incidence rate tool because it makes an assumption about the fact that your incident case is really the first occurrence of an outcome. Rather, you should use the R package cohort incidents because explicitly it was developed to handle these extra cases where a person may come and go into the target cohort multiple times and may uh, have the outcome occur multiple times. And so the cohort incidents package is a more generalized framework for estimating incidents. Uh, and um, eventually, like hopefully relatively soon, that feature will make its way back into Atlas. So it's also part of the web app. But for right now, if you are looking to produce an incidence that is based on acute events that can recur, then we would recommend that you do that through the R package cohort incidents. If you are interested in prevalence, then I will show you uh, show you easily how you can actually do that directly in Atlas just by using a cohort definition. Turns out that the computation of a prevalence is actually pretty straightforward. And so long as you can define what your denominator population is, then you can actually apply an inclusion criteria to represent that numerator and the standardized output of an Atlas cohort definition will give you your prevalence estimate. So I, I have prepared uh, examples of walking through incidence rates, incidence proportions, and prevalence in Atlas to show you how that could work for a multiple sclerosis example. Um, but before I do that, let me stop here and ask if there are any questions about the conceptual definitions of these um, before we go on. Chan. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you for the insightful lecture uh, in the night. So, um, uh, it, there is a, a package for the court, uh, court diagnostics. And in the court diagnostics, they, uh, it provides the temporal characterization or temporal kind of incidence of courts. So, you don't think that the court diagnostics is good for uh, calculating incidence rates. Uh, rather, we should use the court incidence by the definition, right? Yeah, so the, so um, that's a good question, Shan. So a really good point to, to, to address. So in cohort diagnostics, there is a diagnostic function that's called incidence. And um, what is actually calculated in there is an approximation of an incidence. So it is not a formally correct incidence rate estimate. What it instead does is it takes um, first occurrence of the outcomes within the cohort, and it divides it by the number of people in the database for that given time window. What that means, if I go back to the actual formula for an incidence rate, um, let me just go back here. Um, <clears throat> it's number, it is number of new outcomes, but it makes the assumption that you can only have one outcome per person, which depending on your, your cohort may not be uh, appropriate but also it makes an assumption that basically nobody has previously had the outcome before in its denominator. For purposes of cohort, for purposes of its intention, which is just to do diagnostic evaluation of a cohort, it's perfectly good enough. But for purposes of like reporting out a statistic, say in a publication, it, we would not advise that you use that metric. Uh, rather, we would, we would suggest that you compute it correctly using one of our standard packages. And I have actually another uh, question. So 
um, usually many, time, many times we we want to uh, define the court uh, instance uh, with the new denominator of the overall population. So is it feasible to use observation period to define the uh, numerator in this case? Yeah, absolutely. So you could define your incidents as um, new events that occur within all people in the database. The limitation there is um, if an event, if, an, in, if the first occurrence of an event was observed, say, on the first day of an, a person's observation period, you may be worried that that person actually was a prevalent pre-existing condition you just happened to observe. So it's quite common that we would apply rules like um, require that a person be observed for at least some period of time prior to the new event. And so you therefore your denominator, your target population would be something like uh, at least 365 days before some calendar date in the observation time would be your, your denominator. And the reason for that is to ensure that when you see that first occurrence of an event, that you truly believe it's incident and not just continuation of care for some prevalent disease. It somewhat depends on your target disease about how much you care about a washout window. If your outcome was, for example, something like COVID, then um, it probably doesn't matter if you have observation time prior to 2020 um, because COVID didn't exist before then. If, however, you were studying something like multiple sclerosis, then it's highly likely that um, somebody who's observed where their first occurrence on the same day as their start of their observation periods, more likely than not that they've already had the disease for some number of years. And it's just that you didn't register that in your data. Okay, thanks. Louis? Okay, so the non-scientific non, non person is gonna ask. I mean, I understand the formulas and I understand the differences, but and maybe you're going to do this, but can you give me actual examples of when I would use incident weight versus incident proportion versus prevalence, right? I mean, one thing you did say was like, um, I think you said for prevalence, or I forgot, one of them is more MS, right, versus the other, you wouldn't use MS, you might use influenza. So, but what would be a question that people ask that I would use one versus the other versus the other. Yeah, so uh, it's a good question, Louise. So um, let me first start between the distinction between incidence and prevalence. So incidence is when we're looking for new outcomes, and that's most commonly the metric that we care about when we are thinking about comparisons of like the development or onset of some sort of disease. So um, very, very often, uh, part of the reason I try to show uh, just to go back to this thing. Part of the reason I try to show this comparison is it is very, very often, I'll say particularly causal inference, safety surveillance. We want to know, does, does, do the COVID vaccines cause patients to have uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome? In which case, what we really mean is, does taking the vaccine cause a new thing to happen, a new case of, of Guillain-Barre? And when we do that, we might want to estimate the incidence of how often did new Guillain-Barre events occur during people, after people got vaccinated? And that, that would be your observed incidence rate. So how many times did Guillain-Barre happen after exposure to the vaccine? You'd count that up. And then the comparison that the FDA and the EMA are thinking about is, well, that observed rate, how does it compare to some expected rate? So they have gone back to look at background rates where they said, Back in 2018, before the pandemic started, if we take people for a year in the database, how often did a random collection of people for a year, how often did they develop Guillain-Barre? So in that case, it's, 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 it's about developing the disease, not having it. So if you're doing safety surveillance, if you're doing comparative effectiveness, if you're looking at anything where you're thinking about some causal effect on something, then usually you're looking for that new event because something that's pre-existing wouldn't have been caused by some medical intervention of some sort. Um, so 
generally, I'd say almost always, if we're doing population level effect estimation, we generally care about it. We almost never care about prevalence in that context. Also, if we're going to predict, uh, do any patient level prediction where we're trying to predict who's going to go on to develop a disease, that's almost always mm -hmm. incident cases. We because we're not trying to predict that you already have a disease. We're trying to predict that you're going to get it in the future. So much, much more commonly, we care about incidents as the as the as the idea of interest. The reason prevalence is a very common thing that people will talk about and want is because if you're trying to understand uh, within a given population, the overall burden of a given disease, particularly chronic disease, then what we care about is to ask a question like, in 2020, how many people had diabetes? And there, we're not just interested in the people who developed diabetes, that would be the incidence, but we care about those who developed diabetes, plus all those people who have already had it for years and years and years. And prevalence is a good measure of overall burden of disease. We can think about that in terms of like, how much healthcare utilization you have to put towards something. Um, it's much, much less common though that you would make comparisons between prevalences because you're not really, there isn't like a counterfactual to compare to. So if your study was particularly just about disease natural history and just understanding the burden of a given disease, then a prevalence metric can make sense. If, however, you're going to use that number to like make some sort of assertion or inference about something, then you probably are thinking about an incidence for your the metric of interest. Does that make sense? Well, yes, that for me it totally makes sense. And let me try to say this in a non, you know, um, epi or, or or medical way, right? So the way I look at it, if I think about it, what you just said is, if I want to characterize potentially a disease or do a characterization study of some kind, I probably would be wanting the prevalence because. Uh, that, like you said, just tells me of how many people had, had diabetes this year, right? Versus if I was looking at comparing, like, it, it, was this drug more effective or did this drug cause out certain outcomes? I would probably want an incident rate instead. Or you just said predicting, right? Did someone on ADHD end up getting anxiety because yeah. they took the, you know, ADHD medication? That's more of an incidence because it's causing something that they didn't have beforehand. That's right. Right. Yep. And I'll just and I'll cool. add and I'll and I'll add just one other use case because I know it's one of the studies. If you mm -hmm. were to do treatment pa treatment pathway analysis like you previously published, then there you most commonly do want an incident cohort, meaning you want people who newly had the disease, because yep. you're asking the question, what was the sequence of treatments they 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 used? after they started with the disease. And if you basically got prevalent patients who were at different stages of the disease, then it's very hard to do a treatment pathway analysis because the first treatment you observe is probably not their first treatment. It's probably some treatment in the middle of the course of their disease. So in that case also, we will commonly focus on finding the new disease and then following them after a new disease. So incident rate equals new disease. There you go. Prevalence yep. equals everything, it equals overall. That's right. Putting it again, non-medical term. Yes, thank you. I don't know if that helped anybody else, but for a non for a non techie or non a uh, epic geek, that was extremely helpful. Thank you. So practically, I think that when we you when we want to uh, calculate the incidence of the uh, kind, uh, 13 phenotype from the overall population without pre, uh, with the previous one year without that disease, then we may need to define the first year of the cohorts because after a period, you know, after a period uh, starts uh, usually at the first of uh, enrolled dates of the patients, and then they cannot have the one prior prior year. Uh, before the observation period, so it is not easy. You know, it is not possible to define the um, overall population with the uh, with the one um, previous year observation. So, uh, 
uh, we may need to define the first uh, observation period uh, start year uh, for for this uh, for my question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll walk through an example just just to, as an illustration of how we can we can do exactly that in Atlas, and I'll show you just like a, a simple simple way to think about how to create a target population that has your year of prior observation, and then have your your numerator of new outcomes can just be applied to within that target population. Great. Before I jump into the, the live demo, is there any other questions about the conceptual definitions or the ideas behind here? Um, so, hi, hi, this is Xiao Yu from Acubia on uh, Omar team. So I have two questions. One is that do we have any tool to calculate the 95% confidence interval for incidence rate of prowlance? We got uh, like questions from the clients on that. Yeah, uh, very good question. And I'll, I'll try to keep it short, though some people have actually heard me give this large rant. Um, our tools do not compute 95% confidence intervals. And that is actually quite purposeful because they are inappropriate statistics to compute. Even though your customers are asking for them uh, and lots of people ask for them, including reviewers of our papers, they are not a valid statistic. The sim short, short and simple reason why that is the case, a confidence interval is presuming that your data was sampled at random from some general population that um, you are drawing from and the confidence interval is basically telling you if you had taken random draws from that general population, what is the range by which the, the, the mean observation would be observed. And yet none of our databases anywhere in the Odyssey network, certainly none of the IQVIA data sets in any way whatsoever represent a random population drawn from some general population. Instead, all of our databases are very well defined populations. Um, like they represent, you know, the Aju Hospital dataset is the Aju Hospital database. It isn't a sample of anything. It's exactly the people who have gone to the Aju Hospital. Um, and the um, the Acuvia data assets, um, many of them have similarly very well prescribed definitions. Um, and so, therefore, an in incidence is a characterization analysis where the only valid statistic to provide is the actual ob observation of how many how many events were observed in a defined population it is very frequent that we get asked the question how do you compute the the 95 percent confidence if you wanted to do it you can in that as long as you have the numerator number and the denominator number the inc the incidence rate confidence interval is a straightforward uh, mathematical equation that you can type in the numbers to. Um, so it's very trivial. You could do it in Excel or whatever you wanted. Um, however, we've purposely decided to not have the tools produce those numbers because we think that they are misleading and inaccurate numbers to provide. Yeah, thank you. How, I, I, do you, how do you know like whether or not like what real percentage of the population we have to begin with in your data, right? Because you don't know if you're trying to get the overall population and then saying, OK, this is the proportion that I have in my day. You don't know what that overall your proportion is. You can guess, but it's very inaccurate, right? Yeah, so so as a as a as a different approach to it, if um, you take a look at the BMJ paper that we published, what we actually did was we used the Odyssey network of databases. Each database provided its own estimate. And then we yep. did a meta-analysis where we produced a prediction interval. And what a prediction interval actually means is it's not the same thing as a confidence interval within a database. A prediction interval is basically saying, what would we expect the next database estimate to fall? And so it's the idea that if you're actually trying to extrapolate from some collection of databases to the next database, what would be the range that the answer could fall into? And we believe that that's a more honest statistic if we're trying to understand things. And the truth is like with all of our data assets, but you know, using QV as, as an example, like every data asset has um, tremendous measurement error and data capture problems and all sorts of issues. So the systematic error in our characterization 
far uh, far you uh, surpasses any sort of random error, which is the only thing that you're estimating when you can produce a confidence interval. So if you use a database like IQVIA Open Claims, which is gigantic, and you calculate its confidence intervals, they're always really, really, really narrow. And that's not a that's not an honest representation of error. It's it's a it's a artifact of the fact that confidence intervals are really just a function of sample size. In IQV open claims, your sample size is a, is 300 million. So therefore, your your confidence intervals are always tiny. But that doesn't in any way reflect the fact that we don't really have that much confidence in IQV open claims. We know that there's giant holes in the open claims data set. So rather than than using confidence intervals what we what we encourage is thinking about quantifying measurement error and then it, looking across a network to understand the range of outcomes that one could observe yeah thank you thank you for your um, for, for your answer and, and i think my second question is like related kind of related to your answer that um when we calculate the prevalence or the proportion like usually usually the customers will ask like uh, the prevalence of certain conditions is like based on your database, which is probably cover a subset of the entire population. Then how can we generalize this proportion to the entire population? Like, uh, do we have any ways? Or? Yeah, so so there's um, generalizing. There's there can be approaches that one could apply depending on ha depending on your specific source data. Um, the, the epidemiologic approach that one can consider is to do standardization, which is to say, if you knew what the demographics of the population that you are trying to represent were, then you could produce estimates within specific strata, like for example, stratify by age and sex, and you can compute rates, and then you can standardize to the referent population that you want. That only uh, works if the source data that you're using covers all of the different strata that you are interested in within the, the general population. In, in general, lots of people will ask for things like, well, I want the answer to the general population of whatever. And more times than that, our data sources just aren't applicable for that kind of question. We try to mm, do the best we can, but you know, it's like I don't think there's any IQ via data asset that actually is truly generalizable to the overall geography that it's representing. Um, you know, open claims would in the US would be uh, probably the, the best example of a kind of close proxy, except you have to be a person who uh, goes to get healthcare to be in that data source. And there's tons of people in the United States who are you know, don't have access to care. And therefore, like the people who probably need it the most are also end up being the people who are not represented through that process. Sorry, I know, uh, Xiaoyu, you may have more questions, but we'll, I'm looking at time. We have 15 minutes left, oh, and I yeah. want to make sure Patrick, Patrick, you're able to get to the demo and then maybe sure. talk about the 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 some of the questions that the team, the study teams are asking, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so let me let me go through this demo real quick, um, and I'm and everything I'm going to show you is in Atlas. Um, and I just want to orient you to the differences between incidence and, and prevalence as you go through this. So just as an example, I am showing a cohort here, which is persons with multiple sclerosis. I don't want you to pay attention to the, how exactly we define multiple sclerosis. I just want you to think of that as, an, as a disease that we're, we created a cohort for. In this particular case, I'm taking all people at their earliest time of having a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And just to show how the logic fits together, I've created an inclusion criteria that says that these people must have a second diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or a treatment for multiple sclerosis sometime afterwards. So you can think of this as a prevalent cohort that it's finding all people at the very first time that they had some record and they must have some sort of secondary record that kind of is an indicator that they actually have the disease. So here I've defined all the people in the database who ever have multiple sclerosis, according to this logic. Now, if I was interested in creating a prevalence characterization, I would need to define my target population of interest. And so this is what Chan was asking about. So here I've defined a target population, which is just 
people who are in the database on January 1st, 2018. And I'm requiring that on that date, January 1st, 2018, they must have at least 365 days of prior observation. And just, just to, to demonstrate the point said one, one day afterwards. So they got to be in the database on January 1st and they got to make it to January 2nd of 2018. Given this, I've now defined a specific moment in time. 2018 is my it my moment that I'm asking the question, what is the prevalence? Um, and so one could say on, on January, um, there's, there's this notion called a point prevalence, which is to say on January 1st, 2018, what is the prevalence of multiple sclerosis? And the way we could think about computing that would be to say, now that I've found all the people on January 1st, 2018, who are in the database for at least a year, I could basically just determine what proportion of them are in our multiple sclerosis cohort. So just the overlap of those two cohorts gives us the answer we're interested in. In contrast, if I wanted to define an incidence, well, I can't have the people who had pre-existing multiple sclerosis in their records because we are looking for new outcomes and a person who's already had the disease is not eligible for having the disease again. So here, if I wanted to define my denominator, what I could do is say, identify people on January 1st, 2018 with 365 days of prior observation and one day follow up. But I would add a, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong cohort. I wanna show you this one, sorry. Um, uh, I would add an, an initial event which says, and they must not have multiple sclerosis anytime on or before January 1st, 2018. So this basically is eliminating the people who have pre-existing disease. And the reason I would do that is because then I'm left with the denominator of people who are eligible to have a new outcome. So the difference between the target population uh, for the prevalence and the target population for the incidence is the removal of the pre-existing disease. So I'm going to show you. Let me just okay. So now I'm going to show you how we how we estimate prevalence. So given my I'll flip back to it. Given the target population, which is two, January first, two thousand eighteen. All I'm going to do is I'm going to add an inclusion criteria, and my inclusion criteria is going to be has multiple sclerosis prior to or during the year 2018. So I'm going to use the same logic I defined in our cohort, but now I'm putting it inside of an inclusion criteria. So I'm saying it has at least one occurrence of multiple sclerosis, where on that date I have at least one more multiple sclerosis diagnosis or a treatment. And I'm requiring that this occurrence happens any time before and up to 365 days after the January 1st, 2018 date. So this is going to be able to tell us what proportion of people in our denominator satisfy this criteria of having had multiple sclerosis. And if I generate this uh, cohort in any database, I ran a couple just to demonstrate it. I don't know which database I just picked. Uh, I picked the Optum database. What you will see is that um, the Atlas cohort definition just explicitly gives you the answer to your question about prevalence. It's telling us that there was 11,947,730 persons at risk, and of those, 39,725 had the disease or, or developed it during the year 2018. So therefore the prevalence, the, the actual number, if you wanted to have one to report, 0.33% is the prevalence. That's the proper prevalence estimate for, for this particular disease. Um, and so if you want a prevalence, you can just get it directly out of Atlas by creating your target population, defining the disease that they have to have during whatever interval, and then the number that comes back will be your answer to the prevalence question. In contrast, if we wanted to define an incidence in a cohort definition, then we could go through the process of taking our denominator, 
applying our inclusion criteria. And what we would get at the end would be, let's scroll down here. There we go. Would be an incidence proportion in that what it would be telling us is the number of people who were at risk as the denominator, which is 11,909,468. And then it would be telling us the number of new outcomes, which is 2,117. And that means that what the, the, the tool tells you is the incidence proportion, which is 0.02%. So that's number of persons with a new outcome divided by number of persons at risk. I'm showing you this conceptually. I want you to remember the number 2,117, um, but this is one way you could think about it. However, if you are doing incidence rates and you are doing a chronic non-recurrent event, you can actually just explicitly use the incidence rate tool in Atlas. And when you define, when you use this tool, you can add your target cohorts. You're going to notice that I've added two here purposely. I added the prevalence cohort of persons with prior observation, and I also added the incidence target cohort, which is and no prior multiple sclerosis. And I'm doing that just to show you how this tool actually works. I then added our outcome, which was persons with multiple sclerosis. And then I've defined my time at risk as one year. So I'm using 365 days from the index date, which we know is January 1st, 2018. And when we run the incidence rate package, you will actually see for our uh, cohort here, Optum, that case number 2,117, that's that same number we got when we used the cohort, uh, the, use the cohort definition. But what's different and what's better about this particular tool is that you not only get the incidence proportion, which is uh, you know, 1.78 per 10,000 persons, but you also get the incidence rate, which is telling you the number of the number of outcomes divided by time at risk, which in this case is is a similar number of 1.92. So in using the incidence rate package, you are getting both metrics, the incidence rates and the incidence proportion. And depending on the amount of time at a uh, time of interest, like if you define a three year time horizon, those numbers could pretty substantially diverge. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is I, I highlighted here, I've selected in this particular case, the prevalent cohort. But if I select the incident cohort, you're going to notice these numbers don't actually change. And you might be wondering, well, what, something's wrong with the tool or what's going on. But that's because what the incidence rate package actually does is it creates a requirement. Let me go back to the definition to show it. It creates a requirement that you cannot exist in the outcome. Uh, you cannot exist in the target cohort if you've already existed in the outcome cohort. That is to say, if you have pre-existing disease, you have multiple sclerosis before January 18th, you're definitely kicked out no matter what, because you're not eligible to have a new outcome. And so the reason why you see that these counts are not changing between our prevalent cohort and our incident target cohort is because the incidence rate package itself is doing the correction for getting rid of the prior outcomes. So as my recommendation to you all is if you are interested in producing an incidence, um, and you are working on a, uh, a chronic non-recurrent disease, then create a target cohort like we did for the prevalence, which is just like 2018 with a year of prior observation. Define your outcome as just all the outcomes and let the tool take care of cleaning up the pre-existing disease and figuring out what are the new outcomes. It does a really good job of solving that problem for you. If, however, you are dealing with acute uh, recurrent events, then you should not use this tool because that assumption about first occurrence may not be appropriate for you. Or if you are computing prevalence is the metric that you are interested in, then you don't want to use the incidence tool, but rather you'd want to go back and think about how to compute the prevalence directly in your cohort definition. 
Um, I'll just show it just as reference. The cohort incidents package is out on the Odyssey GitHub repo, and um, Chris Knoll is the maintainer of this, but he provides instructions for how you can install the package and call the execute function by passing in cohorts to, to do that if you are not using Atlas. I know that I was so kind still, of long. So Patrick, you still have to define the cohorts in Atlas, but then you yep. run the R packages by just giving it like that cohort number at the top, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. So, okay. so the, cool. the, the primary thing that we were solving by creating the R package was handling all of the complex situations where in your target yep. cohort, you could enter and exit multiple times. And for your outcome, you could enter and exit multiple times. Um, and and it, it does some extra bells and whistles, but basically, that's the real thing that we're trying to overcome the limitation that's that's currently in the Atlas uh, version. And it still does the same thing where that if you so what you just showed earlier, where if you're in the outcome, it will already remove you from the population to begin with, right? Regardless of yeah. how many times you enter. Uh, so it, it, has some, it has some extra outcome. parameters. So it basically allows you to say, how long do you want to look back and remove a person? So it's, it's a little bit, it's, it's a more advanced um, a, set of parameters to let you do okay. that. As a look back period. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yep. So I, I know that was a probably a super fast whirlwind tour through there, but I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Would you be able to put these definitions that you did in the public atlas so that if anybody wanted to look at them right later on and copy them so that they can play with it and do exactly what you're doing? Yep. Would that be possible? Yep, absolutely. I'm happy to stick them out on our collaboration space. That's not a problem. Awesome. Um, so I see there is a question uh, from Chuson about, um, I'm just going to read it out. Uh, that the instance reporting of the accurate events in population level estimation, for example, if traffic accidents can happen by chance and people have, or like Chuson, could you please, you know, just explain the question? Yep. Or I think, can everyone see in the chat? Yeah, so, so Chung Su, it's a, you know, mm -hmm. it's a really good point that you're raising. So in this particular case, if you were thinking about traffic accidents yeah. as your outcome, yeah. I would recommend that you think about that as an acute recurrent outcome. So you could define in Atlas a cohort that was all of the traffic accidents that one person had, and that would allow for a person to have multiple outcomes. And if you were to do that, then if you are interested in estimating incidents, I would recommend you use the, the cohort incidents R package because that will allow for a person to have multiple outcomes to occur. And in that particular case, I would probably recommend that you use an incidence rate because that way you can account for number of outcomes divided by time at risk rather than an incidence proportion, which would be limited to a given person only having one outcome in the numerator. If you're if you're worried about like, you know, a short time horizon, then sometimes that doesn't really matter that much. But if you're take some sort of longer time horizon, then it can matter if you allow for, you know, uh, Presumably traffic accidents are bad and they result in hospitalization. So then you really kind of want to know number of hospitalizations more so than you want to know number of persons who went to the hospital at least once. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know it's, um, it's at the time. Uh, do we have any one last minute questions? I think before we close the call, uh, I know it's quite late U.S. Eastern time already for for both of you, Mui and Patrick. I know you're both um, Eastern. Cool. Um, well, I want to know for those who are running the studies, right? Because the whole purpose of this is so that folks better understand how is it really incident rate? Is it really incident proportion or is it prevalence proportion that we're looking at, right? So for those that are on the phone that has the studies, has this helped clarify which of the three that you really think that you're going to use? I mean, I know we are at time. But 
if you know Patrick still has time or if we think that this is another discussion that people need to go back and maybe rewatch the recording so that they better understand the difference between the three. What is it that they're looking for amongst the, the, the studies that we're doing? Because I, I mean, I think some of most of them are incidents, but is the my I guess the question I would have is, are they truly incidents now that we understand the difference between the three? Right. At least I do. But um that's just me uh not you know so that would be the question to the study leads that are still here right do you guys understand what was explained and do you think that what you're asking for is the right um analytics to you to use for the study doesn't have to be answered right now i understand some people might take a little time to absorb this information. But was this good for you guys to better understand the three? I ask it that way. I know I know the study leads are still here, right? Oh, Chan left. Um, Hong Kong University, I mean, Eric, uh, Sherry, does this help? Now I'm calling on people. <laughs> Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, it's from <coughs> Hong Kong U. It's very good uh, presentation. Thank you very much for teaching us about the uh, internet way and confidence and something like that. Yeah, it's very useful. Thank you very much. So can I ask that as an action item for all of the studies teams, right? Go back and better understand whether or not what you guys are looking for in your study question really matches up to what Patrick explained and then we can have that conversation during our next study class or, or study session right is this the really the right path that you guys were take thinking about taking it may it may not be I don't know um the answer but something to think about cool I got that one saying thumbs up who else is the study folks on this Jing I know I know Chan left and I know Nicole is out sick, so they can't answer. So I and then I think the other one is data quality. So I think we have all of our leaders yeah. study leads here. So, um, and I'll I'll um, be sending the recording to Nicole and everyone, of course. Uh, so uh, and thank you, Patrick, for the deck. So I'll share with everyone um, just to make sure, you know, uh, the, the folks uh, who are not here today will get to, to watch the recording as well. I want to say thank you, Patrick, for all of that. Uh, you make it really sound simple. It, uh, I mean, at least again, for someone who doesn't study medicine or an epi, it, you made it sound really simple that I was able to follow and understand. So uh, we want to thank you. I know it's late on your time. It's 10 o'clock, so we don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, right. Thank well, you very thank much you for your help, and, Patrick. Yep. And if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. That's why I'm here. And then study four is saying they don't collect incidents, uh, but it's important and a great discussion. So study number four also thanks you for the information. So, all right. Thank you, all everybody. Right. See Thanks, you everybody. guys at the APAC, APAC community call, I think this week. Tomorrow, actually. Tomorrow, tomorrow. yes. Tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. All right. Thank all right. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.